Turn the Ship Around by David Marquet. Let's talk about it. What's up everybody? I'm Ashley Noel. Thank you for stopping by. On this channel we talk about leadership tips through book reviews like the one I'm doing right now. We also talk about tips for traveling and working abroad and also military lifestyles. So if any of those topics interest you, please make sure to hit that like button down below and also subscribe. David Marquet, the author of this book, is a retired nuclear submarine captain for the U.S. Navy. And the entire premise behind this book is essentially that the leader-follower model of leadership, which is the dominant form of leadership used today and has been for ages in most workspaces, it is not suitable for those workspaces that are driven more so by one's intellectual abilities and one's ability to be creative rather than just the use of individuals' manual labor. For work environments that do focus on manual labor, the leader-follower model has proven itself effective ever since the industrial era, which is why it still remains so widespread today. But in today's times where a lot of jobs are more cognitive based, where employees are expected to have a lot of technical expertise and to be able to apply and synthesize information, be innovative, use their creativity skills, the leader follower model just doesn't work. It actually does more harm than good. Instead, Marquet advocates for a leader leader model and throughout his book he describes how he put that leader-leader model into play when he was commanding a nuclear submarine and how in doing so it completely turned his ship around from being literally the worst ship in the fleet by all measures to the leading ship in the fleet by all measures and he was able to do that just within a span of a few years and those benefits that he was able to instill in that ship were able to last far beyond his command so that the ship was able to continue to excel even after he'd gone. So what is the leader-leader model? When major aspect of the leader-leader model is pushing control down to lower levels as much as possible. This allows those who have the technical expertise to actually use it while the leader oversees the overall project. You can think of this sort of like a forest for the trees type of analogy. As the leader, your job is to ensure the overall health of the forest as a whole and to make sure that the forest thrives. Leave the care of the individual trees to your technical experts. Everyone in the company should be on the same page as to what the overall forest should look like and as the leader, it's your responsibility to convey that grander vision so that everyone understands the goal they're working towards. But then, allow your team as much as possible to be able to control the planning, maintenance, and enhancement of the the trees and the land while you oversee the entirety of the project. Marquet doesn't use the forest and the trees analogy, but that's how I conceptualize it in my mind. Marquet explained that when he was preparing to take command of the ship, he had studied for an entire year on the USS Olympia and her crew, and at the last minute his assignment was changed and he was being ordered now to take command of the USS Santa Fe. So from the very beginning, he didn't have technical expertise on the Santa Fe, and so he had to rely on his crew to be able to understand the day-to-day -day maintenance and operations of the ship. One thing that Marquet did is that whenever there was a task that needed to be planned for and accomplished on the ship, he would name one of his senior enlisted officers to be the chief in charge of that plan. So this allowed for the senior enlisted officer to have the opportunity to be able to take charge of a situation and lead a crew to success, but also it required them to develop a greater technical expertise in what they were doing because at that point they were no longer just following someone else's orders. Orders, but they actually had to think and make decisions for themselves. It also gave them a greater sense of the organization's purpose just because in choosing what they had to do, they had to make sure that their plans and their decisions aligned with the captain's overall objective for the ship. Similarly, when it came to the officers, Marquet actively avoided telling them what to do. Instead, the officer would come to Marquet and he would say, I intend to, and then whatever it was he was planning to do, he would give a sufficient enough report on his rationale for why he wanted to do what he wanted to do and Marquet would just say very well and the officer could go get it done. So this was another way that Marquet was able to ensure that his officers were thinking at the next higher level because now they had to think like the captain and not only that but they had to think about the rationale and why it was the best choice and be able to express their rationale clearly enough so that it could be articulable and people could understand it. Another thing that Marquet advocates for when it comes to trying to develop leaders out of everybody around you is thinking out loud. So my home station boss back in the UK, he's actually really good at this, this concept of thinking out loud. So he has a lot of experience in criminal litigation, so trying cases in court. And so I know he knows a lot more than I do when it comes to that area of law. So 
So one thing that I like to do is I'll present him with a problem and I'll just listen to him think it through because he does think out loud. And so every avenue that his mind goes down to try to solve this problem, I'm able to learn from and I'm able to learn from his past experiences, his, his expertise, just to figure out how he's solving the problem. It's super beneficial to me because now I'm able to see the problem in a much grander perspective than I would have been able to with my own limited information and expertise in the area. But also whenever he hits a wall in his analysis, now I'm able to chime in and try to help problem solve to a solution just because I can actually hear how he's processing this information. So one super efficient way to get your subordinates to start thinking at that higher level is just to tell them your thought process and allow them to help problem solve with you. Another concept that Marquet promotes is that as the leader, you have to make yourself fungible for the sake of the organization as a whole. This understanding of your role is actually a big focus in the military, and Marquet doesn't use the word fungible. That's just a word that I have come in contact with a lot since I've been in the military, so that's the word that I use. But before I was in the military, I knew what the word fungible meant. Like I understood the definition of it just by like SAT prep and whatnot, but I I had never been personally called fungible before, but my, my first boss, I remember they called me fungible. Don't ever forget that you're fungible, at least on a quarterly basis. Essentially in the military, we cannot set up our units so that the loss of any individual person would result in mission failure. No individual person can be that indispensable. People deploy and they're gone for months on end. The home station unit can't go mission failure because now this one individual is no longer in the game. Same thing down range. You know, you can have injuries, you can have fatalities, and again, the unit can't go mission failure just because this one person is no longer in the fight. As a military, we have to set up our units so that each individual is fungible so that the mission can continue on to success even if somebody goes down. To make yourself fungible, you have to properly train your subordinates to be able to take on operations even in your absence. And this is beneficial to the organization as a whole because it sets the organization up for perpetual success because they're able to still thrive even after you're gone. Also, it helps make the subordinate leaders in your organization much less dependent on you which just makes your job easier. Another point Marquette makes is that if you treat people like followers, they're gonna behave like followers. When your subordinates know that they're nothing more than followers, when they have limited decision-making abilities, then that gives them very little incentive to give their all in terms of their energy, their intellect, or their passion to a project. And a lot of us have been in this situation before. At first, as the follower, you're probably a little bit resentful of the leader for putting you in that sort of situation. But after a while, you get numb to it and you stop complaining because your job is easy. You don't have to think, you don't have to make decisions, you're not really accountable for anything or responsible for anything. You just follow orders, you do what you're told. But in a job that requires cognitive ability, you know that you're being wasted as an asset to the organization because you're being underutilized by your leader. That's an easy trap for supervisors to fall into, especially supervisors who micromanage and practice that top-down leader-follower style of leadership. And Marquet explains that when this sort of thing happens, people who are treated as followers treat others as followers when it's their turn to lead. A vast untapped human potential is lost as a result of treating people as followers. Only in the long run, three to ten years later, does it become obvious, but by that time people have moved on to new jobs. Lastly, Marquet advocates for shifting the focus from avoiding errors to recognizing achievement. One thing that I've heard a lot during my time in the military is that if you're going to fail, that's okay, just fail forward. What this essentially means is that you are going to fail. Your people are going to fail. We all do. That's a given. You can just take that as inevitable. That's okay. What's key is that when you do fail, just make sure that you're learning from those mistakes and using that knowledge to make better decisions moving forward. That's failing forward. 
And I'm not saying don't try to do well or don't try to be perfect, but just understand that by making mistakes, in a lot of ways, that's how we learn. There's a quote by Thomas Edison. A reporter was asking him how it felt to fail 10,000 times in making a light bulb before he finally got it right. And he responded, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Fail forward. One point that Marquet makes about this is that on his ship, everybody always focused on avoiding errors because that's what was tracked, what mistakes were made. And they did it so that they could understand those mistakes and how not to make them in the future. And while that's important for understanding process processes and avoiding critical errors before they occur, that sort of mentality can become debilitating when avoiding errors becomes the objective for your organization. The reason is that once the crew was able to complete an objective without any mistakes, that was it, mission accomplished. But they never felt any impetus to strive any further to become truly exceptional. In terms of recognizing achievement, Marquet writes, look at your structures for awards. Are they limited? Do they pit some of your employees against others? That structure will result in competition at the lowest level. If what you want is collaboration, then you're destroying it. Instead, Marquet proposes to have awards that are abundant and without limit, that don't pit employee versus employee, but instead pit your team against the world. So external competitors or even nature. For example, on a submarine, apparently if there's a fire and you don't get the fire hose to the site of the fire within two minutes, then it can be catastrophic. So for an exercise, you can make it so that the goal of the exercise is to get the fire hose to the site of the fire and each team that is able to do that within two minutes gets an award, even if the award is just a superior grade on the exercise. It doesn't matter if there are three teams that get to the scene within two minutes or 10 teams that get to the scene within two minutes. If you get to the scene within two minutes, then you get an award. Because in real life, if you don't get to the scene within two minutes, then people die. And still within that system, you can still rack and stack the teams to show how they compared with the other teams that will naturally make people just want to strive to improve their time so that they can rank higher in the next exercise. It's basically just gamifying the exercise, but you're no longer pitting your people against each other. Everyone who meets the goal gets the award. That's all I've got for this one. If you like this video or learn something new, please make sure to hit that like button down below and also hit subscribe. It does actually help the channel and lets me know that the information that I'm providing is actually useful. I post new videos every week, so hopefully I will catch you same time next week. Thank you again for stopping by. I do appreciate your time and I'll see you.